away from a system of manufacturing by blue-collar workers, to Mill, society focuses now on selling commodities in the form of the white-collar worker. The art of customer sales and services, of course, aligns itself with a fake, empathetic disposition, where one is expected to smile and cater to the customer's requests merely as a means to assist with the generation of more sales. As such, with empathetic emotions being used solely to sell, man alienates himself emotionally, where he not only puts on a false emotional act for others, but they in turn do the same to him. Thus, true human emotional contact is eclipsed by a false sense of emotional engagement that leaves everyone unable to truly express themselves, and thus leaving themselves more alienated from others than ever doing so solely for the sake of meeting capitalistic sales and quotas. In short, no one's expressed emotional sentiments are any longer genuine, but merely marketing statements issued so as to manipulate others through a tactical form of empathy, so as to increase successful sales rates. We sell a false emotion to others, and they in return do the same to us for the sake of economic profit, which keeps all people emotionally apart. Such a marketing mentality replaces emotional substance with superficial emotional forms of mimicry. To Guy Debord is this very spectacle that has eclipsed any semblance of society, where superficial images outweigh reality, and where the appearance of something proves of the utmost importance. Images and appearance thus mediate all social interactions. The acquisition of status symbol commodities are the modes in which we present ourselves to people, wearing trendy clothes, having a good house or car, an expensive haircut, etc., rob us of authentic forms of living, and replace them with inauthentic appearances acquired by commodities. We no longer see real people. We merely see the appearances people convey by the products they purchase and thus associate with. You thus become not what you are, but what you appear to be through your purchasing power, given over to mass media marketing obsessions and the like. What links the two thinkers is their belief in that there is an actual base to reality. Conversely to Lacan, the real exists outside of language itself. Like a mathematical limit that does not exist, it thus remains undefined upon approach. Similarly, we can approach reality but never reach it through linguistic definitions. With Baldriard, we get something similar in terms of hyperreality, which Baldriard defines as the generation by models of a real without origin or reality. In other words, hyperreality is a series of representations, signs, and symbols of reality that have no origin or initial point of reference to reality itself, since it rests outside of symbolic expression. Thus, when we discuss the real real, what can we mean but that which exists outside of signs and symbols, an impartial and indifferent planet that succumbs to instinctual silence? To quote Alfred Korzybski, the map is not the territory. Thus, any attempt to map out such a reality by modes of models makes it hyper-real and without origin to reality, since reality exists outside of symbolic mappings and modes of expression. The real thus cannot be known, a Kantian noumena, outside of language and sense perception. Since the mind operates through the association of symbols, we cannot define that which is undefined, even if we redefine our discourse. Reality cares not of neo-rationalist reasoning. The truth takes our tongues, since it cannot be told. Though we cannot talk of reality, we can comment on the hyper-reality in which we are housed. That which is commonly known as society and culture is not reality, but fantasy. It's the fantasy story in which you're situated. Since there is nothing outside the text, we can all work on becoming better storytellers, I suppose, writing over the prescribed text we are otherwise required to read. By adding our own text, we can change the meaning of the story itself. Azindari Da's idea of difference, meaning is postponed or put off or deferred because words are ambivalent, and thus constantly changing meanings based on the context in which they are situated and the words by which they are surrounded. So unless we are happy with the hyperreality in which we are housed, and are happy with the code of the current program in which we play, or enjoy the script that we are meant to act out on our current stage, then we need to do nothing short of editing everything that is around us, altering the text order, creating new concepts so as to reconstruct the script and thus the story,
to reprogram the program, opening up the closed loop of cyclic truths into a spiral of open potentialities and interpretations. Reality is not opposed to fiction. Rather, reality is comprised of fictitious stories. The Matrix movie did not escape Plato's allegory of the cave. There is no real reality to escape to, as we remain trapped to semiotics. We cannot ever unplug from the Matrix or escape the shadows that we interpret to be true. We can only engage in endless interpretations. Not even metafiction truly gets a reader outside a story, since by reading it, they don't set the book aside. We can allude to reality, but never get outside the book. But though we may not know reality by being bound to this book, we still have reason yet to write.